Well, what a joy and privilege it is to be able to speak to you once again. And inadequate as it is, we are still able to spend this time together meeting with Jesus, the eternal Son of God in the Bible. And I pray that as we spend this short time together, uh, that it'll be a blessing and an encouragement to you. We're still in the midst of our national lockdown. The days are cold and dark. And in the midst of these days of great trial and hardship, we're going to begin a new series today, Christmas in the Prophets. Looking back to those wonderful ways in which the old Hebrew prophets predicted Christmas and the things that change the world forever. And it's in a way we're saying it's Advent in advance. Advent the way in which from the very beginning of the world, people looked forward to Bethlehem and the ways in which we today look forward to Jesus coming again and live in the light of that glorious reality when he does, just as he's promised, returned and judges the world, brings justice and sets everything right and brings about his new creation. And in that way, I hope you can see that where the Bible ends in Revelation chapter 22 by saying, come Lord Jesus, is really where human history begins. All of human history has been that prayer, come Lord Jesus, come and join us in Bethlehem, come again and renew all things and usher in your new creation. Let's set things up by stepping back a little bit. It was long held by cultures and civilizations all across the world that one day the birth of a great one beyond the normal possibilities of human biology would take place and would change everything forever. Foretold by the stars, written about in ancient prophets and seers, heralded by angels, if you like epic computer games. I must admit I did in my time. I quite enjoyed them. And the story is set up that you're the hero that all the prophecies have converged about and that you are the one that will deliver the world at the point of its deepest need. Zelda series, some of us may know on the Nintendo game system, incredible games like built around that story. Now, such was the excitement in real life. Now, not in computer games, in real life. And the longing, there was an in-depth investigation of the circumstances of the births of great generals and leaders among the Romans, the Greeks, the Chinese, the Persians, the Babylonians, looking for signs and omens of the coming of this great one to be born as saviour, divine warrior, cosmic ruler, great high priest, before whom all the created order would bow down and recognize its master and its God. One of my favorite early Christian writers in the second century, Justin Martyr, who was a Greek philosopher who became a Christian, said this, there existed long before this time, so that's the second century, uh, certain men more ancient than all those who are esteemed philosophers, both righteous and beloved by God, who spoke by the divine spirit and foretold events which would take place and which are now taking place. They are called prophets. These alone both saw and announced the truth to men, neither reverencing nor fearing anybody, nor influenced by desire for glory, but speaking these things alone, which they saw and which they heard being filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't use argument in their writings, seeing that they were witnesses to the truth above all argument and worthy of belief. And those events which have happened and which are happening compel you to assent to what they had said. Isn't that amazing in the second century, the way in which Justin Martyr set them up and described them? There were about 30 different prophets writing over a period of about 1,500 years, many of whom had no contact with uh, one another and very, very different backgrounds. Some giving rise to somewhere between 300, 450 detailed prophecies coming together and converging in one place 
and one time. Uh, one mathematician calculated something of the probability of all those independent properties converging in one place at one time and worked out that it would be the equivalent of 1 to the uh, in 10 to the power of 17, which is quite improbable. <laughs> Let's put it like that. It's the same, it was said, as putting a dollars all across the state of Texas and then choosing the correct one. It's not very likely. Let's be honest. Of these prophets, perhaps the greatest was Isaiah, writing about 2,700 years ago. Some have called him the evangelical prophet or the fifth evangelist because there is so much in his writings about Christ, the center of the gospel. And of course, he writes with great majesty, beauty of vision of Christ, the Son of God, and his comprehensive work, his coming down, his joining us, his suffering and dying, and then his rising again and his renewal of the entire universe. And so we begin our series of Christmas in the Prophets with Isaiah. We had to begin with the mighty Isaiah. Let's zoom in a little bit before we look at Isaiah chapter 7 together. They were dark and difficult days in which Isaiah chapter 7 is set. Great political turmoil and upheaval in the ancient land of Judah. Very much like the days in which we are living ourselves today. These were the days of Ahaz, king of Judah. Now of all the kings in this long line in the house of David, Ahaz was one of the worst kings. If we read more of his backstory in 2 Kings chapter 16, we'll see that he committed appalling crimes against God and against humanity, among which uh, he even sacrificed his own son in a, a fire as a pagan sacrifice. Things were at a very low ebb. Now, the political landscape was changing fast in that day. And so verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 7, when Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Reason of Aram and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. So this king of Aram, Reason, um, of this nearby nation, and the king of northern Israel, Pekah, had formed an alliance to fight against Judah, the small southern kingdom with Jerusalem as its capital where Ahaz was reigning from. Why had they done that? Well, presumably, it was because they were trying to force Judah to join them in an alliance against the rising Assyrian Empire and its uh, hostile and aggressive foreign policy. Now, although this effort to force them into the alliance failed... Jerusalem uh, and Jerusalem was able to withstand their attack. Both Ahaz and his people were deeply shaken by the experience. Look at verse 2. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Isn't that a powerful description of the trees shaking in a great storm? And that's what the hearts of the people were like with this the, the alliance and the great foreign attack moving towards them. And we can understand and relate to that feeling today of hearts being shaken like trees in the forest. You know, I, I came across an article a few days ago. I don't, know what, I don't want to misquote the, uh, that, uh, the title of that article, but it was by the BBC and it said something like, COVID is here. What else should we be worrying about? And we know that hearts, our own hearts, and hearts of people all around us and the nation as a whole are being blown and shaken like trees in a forest. Now, what did they do uh, in response to the, the, the threat which they were under? Well, if you look at 2 Kings chapter 16, 
verses seven to nine, where it gives more of the backstory of Ahaz, you see that what Ahaz did was he went the complete opposite direction. So instead of joining the alliance between Aram and Northern Israel, he actually joined the Assyrians and paid them money to form an alliance with them against the other two nations. Um, but the Lord of all sent his prophet and his friend Isaiah to have a word with Ahaz about what he had done. Look at verse 3. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Sheer Jashub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. So Isaiah was to go out and to meet the king, to bring his son, Sheer Jashub, whose name meant like a remnant would return. So things were going to be cut back. They were going to cut, be cut very far back until there was only a very small number. In fact, really only one left. And they were to meet at the Upper Pool Aqueduct uh, on the way to the Washerman's Field. Now, it seems like a slightly random place to meet, but it wasn't a random place. It's a place that comes up again in the Bible if you follow it through. And it was, of course, the place that the city of Jerusalem and Ahaz in particular would have been looking to for a water supply if the city of Jerusalem had been besieged by the hostile foreign powers. And it was to, at that place that Isaiah was to go and meet Ahaz, the place that he would have been very inclined to look to for resources to deal with the city being besieged. And there he was to speak to I am Ahaz the king. Now, what did the Lord have to say to Ahaz at this time through Isaiah? Well, it was good news in verses 4 to 9. Uh, say to him, be careful, keep calm. And don't be afraid, don't lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of reason and Aram and of the son of Remaliah. Aram, Ephraim and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, let us invade Judah. Let's tear it apart and divide it among ourselves and make the son of Tebal king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only reason. Within 65 years, Ephraim will um, be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. In other words, both nations that at this point seemed so strong, so aggressive, would within a matter of years be completely gone. And almost forgotten. And all of their malice and spite would be gone completely. And what was urged upon Ahaz? The end of verse 9. Do you see it? If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Stand firm in your faith, Ahaz. In other words, what was being said was this. Trust me. Do not trust in your own resources, whether it's making an alliance with another foreign power, another government and another king, or even looking to this little pool of water and the aqueduct outside of Jerusalem. Don't look to your own resources in these ways. Trust me. Look above and depend upon me. And if you do that, then you will be able to stand firm when the wind blows in the midst of the storm. Now, in his incredible grace and mercy, the Lord God of Israel then made an incredible offer. Look at this in verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign whether in the highest depths, so the deepest depths, or in the highest heights. It was a remarkable one-time offer to ask for any sign that he wanted to prove these great words of comfort to be faithful and dependable and true. Now, 
We might uh, remember back to Gideon, uh, who had asked for the fleece to be wet and to be dry in that famous way. And this was a one-time offer. Everything was on the table. Ahaz could have asked for anything that he wanted. He could have asked for the sun to stop shining or for the stars to move around or all the oceans to dry up. There was nothing off the table. What would you have asked for if that offer was put on the table for you? I'm not quite sure. You know, would you have like your name written in the stars or something? Anything was possible. Later on, for example, his son Hezekiah asked that the shadow that the sun made on the stairs would go back. Now, the mind boggles at how such a thing was actually possible to take place. And we think further back to Joshua and the book of uh, Joshua chapter 10 and the Gibeonites. And the way in which uh, that battle took place and the sun stopped in the sky. Now, this is a very big vision of what's possible and what the living God can do. It's very easy for us as modern people to be locked into a very small view of what the living God can do and to think that he's as much a subject to what we describe as the laws of nature as we are. Of course, the real God of the Bible is not. The real God of the Bible, the Father, Son, and Spirit, has complete freedom to do whatever he wants to do in the heavens above and the earth beneath. And nobody can blow the whistle. He can do whatever he wants to do. Uh, how would Ahaz respond to this incredible one-time offer? And this is where it becomes, oh, what a disaster. He could have asked for anything. What does he do and say? In verse 12, Ahaz said, I will not ask. I won't put the Lord to the test. Now, it seems at first glance that it's a very humble thing to say, oh, you know, I don't want to put the Lord God to the test because I trust him and love him so much. And we might remember the echo of those words in the temptations in the wilderness with the Lord Jesus himself. But what Ahaz is saying here is nothing like what Jesus would say. No, not at all. It's a very, very different spirit. It's not and not, and not asking for a sign out of reverence and love. It's much more, I just don't really care. I'm not very interested. I don't want to ask for a sign at all. This one time offer on the table and Ahaz doesn't even have the interest to ask for anything at all. Look at Isaiah's response. That's what shows the spirit behind what Ahaz had said in verse 13. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? See what Isaiah is saying? He's saying, your stubbornness and your refusal to trust and to take advantage of this one-time offer isn't only trying my patience, and that's something, but it's trying the patience of the living God as well. Then he makes this Wonderful statement in verse 14, this very, very famous prophecy. Therefore, the Lord himself will give a sign, something that will signify something else. Prove his reality and his power and his ability to protect and to save his people in such a way that there need be no recourse to human resources and possibilities. Whether it's an aqueduct and a small water supply or a political alliance with another nation, what would this sign be, like an impossible sign? In the highest heights and the deepest depths, verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign greater than anything that Ahaz could have ever have imagined or that we could have imagined. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. A sign not only for Ahaz, but for countless 
hundreds of millions down history and across the world ever since. This sign would be beyond anything possible in the deepest depths and the highest heights that a virgin would give birth to a son and would call him Emmanuel. In other words, a birth would take place in this world which would be unlike any other before or since in a way that no one else could be born. Not by the strength and power of human generation of the man, nor even by female conception, but something which would be just as impossible as an empty tomb and someone to rise from the dead. Now, it's important that we have to just say it at this point, just to clarify this little misconception. For many years, it was contested uh, that the word which was used for virgin in the original could also mean a young woman who was married. And so when you read the early Christian writings, you'll see that they were engaging with uh, non-believing Jews who were saying that this simply meant that a young woman who was married would give birth to a child. Now, of course, the, among other things, the, the, the argument of the Christians and the response was to say, well, that's not a very good sign. And I love their response because, I mean, that happens all the time. Young married women have children all over the place, all across the world. That's not a great sign. It's hardly a sign that's, you know, higher than the highest heights and lower than the deepest depths. That doesn't seem like a very remarkable sign. No, there was, of course, another word available in the original language, which could have signified that, which was not used. The word is virgin. And that is what is being said in this wonderful sign. And so ever since in the Apostles' Creed, it is acknowledged by Christians all across the world and confessed that I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. The one to be born of the virgin would be Emmanuel, God with us. In other words, he who was eternally begotten of the Father as his eternal Son would, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be born of the Virgin Mary and take on our flesh to become our brother and to become one of us, a member of the human race, to cast in his lot with you and me forever, and to join our side and to be with us as our brother forever and ever. God the Father is for us. He's for you. And now his son would, is for you as well as your brother forever. And when he joins our side, he tips the scales, doesn't he, in our favor. Old Charles Wesley put it beautifully like this when he said, we the, we the sons of men rejoice, the prince of peace proclaim, when he, with heaven's host lift up, our, lift up our voice and shout Emmanuel's name. Knees and hearts to him we bow of our flesh and of our bone. Jesus is our brother now, and God is all our own. Now, let's just push a little bit further into this reality of the virgin birth. Today is not the day for shallow thinking. We need to think a little bit more deeply. Why the virgin birth? And why is it that if a person does not acknowledge and confess that Jesus was born of the virgin Mary, that that person is not a Christian? Why is that the case? Well, many people have thought very deeply about these things. One of the people that I love the best is Karl Barth, and he thought a lot about this glorious reality. And what he does is takes it right back to the one of the earliest prophecies in the Bible given to Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that the seed of the woman alone would come who would take the fight to that ancient serpent, the devil, and in the course of that fight would himself be wounded, but would destroy the devil in that great struggle. Now, in that ancient prophecy, 
man, Adam, was set aside, put on the sideline. He would have no involvement in what was to happen. The one who would come and save the human race would be born of the woman alone, born of a virgin. And see how in this way there's a negative side, we might say, to the virgin birth. In the sense that human strength, the strength of the human man is put aside. He has no part in what was to come and what was to happen. Proud, sinful Adam is set aside. And what was to come and what was to happen in this one to be born wouldn't do 90% of what was needed for our salvation and we contributed 10% or any other might know he would do it all alone, 100% to save us. And can you see how in that way there's a parallel between the way in which Jesus came into the world as our brother and how he would leave the world as our brother? That he would come into the world through a door that said no entry, just as he would leave the world through another door that would say no exit. Those that gave up believing in the virgin birth were also those, of course, that would very soon give up believing in the empty tomb. But Christians know that the one who was born of the virgin also walked out of his own grave. And so on the positive side of what is signified by the virgin birth is that not just sinful human strength is set aside, but rather divine power from above. As the Son of God becomes our brother, all of his initiative and power and strength is brought to bear and he joined our family and he came to do all that was needed to save us and to set us right. And he began a new kind of human life. A new kind of life for us all to be born again into, in which to be human was to be a son or a daughter of his almighty father. So can you see why this sign of all signs was the one that would be offered to Ahaz, this proud, sinful human king who trusted in his own resources, whether it was political alliances or this little aqueduct, to him, this sign was to be given that all human strength would be set aside and salvation would come from above as the eternal son would come down and be born of a virgin to save us and to join our family forever. Now, by the time this Emmanuel child would be born, the problems of both Aram and, and Israel in the north would be long gone and forgotten. Did this prophecy come true? Of course it did. Jesus was born, the long-awaited Messiah, the hope of the ages, the desired of the nations, was born in Bethlehem. The calendar was reset. History began again. And the years in which we live are the years of our Lord, Anno Domini. And all of this he achieved by simply being born, not by doing anything, just by being born and coming down among us. And as a man, he promised, Lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. He is Emmanuel. Today, there is great temptation for you and for me. In the midst of what's happening all around us, hearts, minds shaking, being blown as trees in the wind, to like Ahaz so long ago, to trust only in our own very limited human resources, not just to political alliances or to aqueducts, but to trust what we can do as the human race by ourselves and to put all of our eggs in that one basket. Today, let's remember the sign of the virgin. Let's remember that our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, has come. And that the God who set aside all of human strength and power and who came down to save us is still with us. 
by the power of his Holy Spirit, and that where our possibilities end is where his begin. You know, today, whether it's within our own lives, it's possible for us to very much box in what the living God can do, and yet he still can act with complete freedom to save us and to help us and to draw near, to relieve us of burdens, to change the very outlook which we have in life and to give us his perfect peace and our nation. Isn't it a sadness? You know, as I was preparing for today, I felt a great sadness in my heart that there have been very few that have even suggested that in the midst of what we're experiencing at the moment, that it could even be a possibility to look higher up and to knock the door of heaven for help and for answers for ourselves and for our nation. Very few have called for a day of national prayer, repentance or fasting, as if like the living God has nothing to offer and all the resources that we have to deal with are the limited ones of ourselves. Let's, this week, commit ourselves to trust in this God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to give ourselves to him. And then, as was promised so long ago, if we do not stand firm in our faith, we will not stand at all. But if we will trust, if we will hold on, if we will stand in our faith, we will find that we will stand and that our hearts will not be blown by the wind, but we will stand through this time, through these dark and difficult days as witnesses, as lights to shine in the darkness for the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May he richly bless you and may you know his strength as you stand for him where you are in this coming week. And therefore to God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be ascribed all the glory, all the honor, all the power now and forever. Amen.